welcome everybody. I'm uh, really pleased to uh, to uh, welcome you all to today's webinar, uh, sponsored by Kate. Um, my name is John Ward, and uh, despite a raspy voice in the, from some unspecified virus, I'm going to uh, I am uh, moderating the session. Uh, I was asked to say a few things about myself. Um, uh, I guess based largely on actually it's, it's, today's actually my 67th birthday and uh, largely based on how old I am and friendships I've cultivated over the years. I, I, I am a clinical professor in the UBC Department of Emergency Medicine. Um, my career perspective, uh, in my, the early years of my career, I actually spent five years as a, as a clinical hematologist, uh, following which I pivoted to uh, emergency medicine and spent about 25 years doing a combination of general internal medicine and emergency medicine. And in the last five years, I clinically exclusively work as an emergency physician at uh, St. Paul's Hospital and Mount St. Joseph's Hospital in Vancouver. Um, in terms of disclosures, I, um, I have sat on an advisory board for uh, AstraZeneca in relation to Index and Alpha, uh, but have, uh, have no other uh, dis uh, conflicts. Um, and basically, the topic of, of today's uh, webinar was was conceived by the Scientific Planning Committee of CAPE. Uh, so we can thank Drs. Eddie Lang, Stacey Kitts, Kirat Grewal, and Peter Araklius for, for developing the program. Um, we do have an educational grant from uh, AstraZeneca. Um, and um, in the interest of, of uh, prevent, preventing or mitigating any, any potential biases, um, the uh, information we talk about today, one will use generic medication names and uh, any recommendations and that sort of thing will be based on uh, uh, peer reviewed literature. Um, so it's kind of interesting sort of reflecting back on this as, as uh, I've asked to do this, it, it struck me that it's really not that long ago that, um, that there was no such thing as DOAX uh, in, in, in terms of in, in clinical use in Canada. And I started looking back at the initial atrial fibrillation studies with anti 10 a inhibitors uh, in atrial fibrillation. And those really came out in about 2011. Um, because everybody was really concerned about the fact that we were giving these drugs with, that had no antidotes, they're were, they were actually really slowly adopted in Canada. Um, but once they kind of, there was kind of a tipping point to the extent now that, you know, it seems like, you know, half of the adult population in Canada is, is on a DOAC. So I think it's a, a topic that's really um, uh, worth visiting today. Um, you know, al although these drugs are clearly are, are off clearly offer many advantages over uh, warfarin, um, people do bleed on on any coagulants, and and uh, so I think it's something that we're seeing increasingly frequently, and something that uh, you know is, is as I say is very worth talking about. Uh, basically, learning objectives for today's session, um, one is to evaluate and mitigate uh, bleeding risks associated with the use of uh, DOAX in uh, particularly in special populations in the emergency department. Um, it's to manage GI bleeding in patients on uh, DOAX and to adopt strategies to manage intracranial bleeding and anticoagulation in patients on DOAX. Um, as with most of these sessions, it's, it's often way more useful if, uh, if it's interactive. Um, and there are two ways we can do that. One is if you have questions um, that come to mind during the, during the um, presentations is to um, put your questions into the chat uh, feature on Zoom. Uh, and then we're also using Ment uh, Mentimeter. Um, so you'll be polled at various times throughout the presentation uh, in terms of how you'd like to manage patients or, or proceed with different cases. And uh, this slide basically shows you how you can do that. So you can either visit the website uh, listed there, or you can use the QR code uh, to answer the questions as they come up. Um, so we're actually very fortunate today. We have two very uh, highly qualified speakers um, to, uh, to talk about these, uh, these topics with us. Uh, first is Dr. Vicki Tagalakis. Uh, she's the Associate Chair of the Department of Medicine at McGill University and Physician-in-Chief of Medicine at the Jewish General Hospital. Uh, she's a research scientist uh, in the Center of Epidemiology and Community Studies at Lady Davis Institute for Medical Research at the Jewish General. 
and her clinical interest is in the diagnosis and management of venous thrombotic, thrombotic disorders with a principal area of focus on venous thrombosis in cancer patients. Uh, Dr. DeWitt's uh, career trajectory warms my heart. Uh, she studied, uh, she trained in both internal medicine and emergency medicine uh, in the UK. And then um, after coming to Canada, did a thrombosis fellowship in Ottawa in 2013. Uh, she currently works in both emergency medicine and thrombosis uh, in Kingston. Uh, she leads a research program at Queen's University that focuses on the diagnosis of bleeding and clotting disorders in the emergency department um, and is funded by uh, CIHR. And without further ado, Dr. Tag Lackis, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ward. Uh, and I believe... Uh, um, I have started uh, sharing the screen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today uh, to speak on uh, the management um, of uh, direct oral anticoagulant uh, related bleeding. Um, and I'll begin with the first case uh, that has to do with gastrointestinal bleeding. So these are my uh, disclosures. Um, I don't have any uh, financial relationships or advisory board memberships or patents on drugs uh, related to this uh, specific talk. So we'll begin with the first case um, of Mary. Uh, she's a 69 year old woman with atrial fibril uh, fibrillation. Um, she has uh, a CHADS 3 and uh, is taking dabigatran. Uh, she presents to the emergency department with bloody stools for the past three days. Uh, her past medical history include hemorrhoids, uh, diabetes, and hypertension, and her medications are um, dabigatran at 150 milligrams twice daily, lisinopril 10 milligrams once a day, and atorvastatin 20 milligrams once a day. Um, her initial vital signs include a heart rate of 89 beats per minute and a blood pressure of 134 over 70 millimeters of mercury. And um, some of her initial laboratory studies um, are done that indicate that her hemoglobin is at 110, uh, down from a previous of 125 six months ago. Her platelets are at 300 and her creatinine is 130 micromoles per liter. So we know bleeding on anticoagulants um, is uh, something, as Dr. Ward mentioned, uh, because of the increasing usage of DOAC uh, over the past 10 years, um, uh, bleeding is inevitably something that we will have to deal with. Um, it is the most common side effect uh, of, uh, with anticoagulant usage. Uh, it uh, accounts for two to 4% of major bleeds and at between 10 to 12% of clinically relevant non-major bleeding. Uh, it's estimated that 60% of adverse drug-related visits to the emergency room in the United States are due to anticoagulants, include, as well as opioids and hypoglycemics. And uh, recent data estimate that the case fatality related to a major bleed um, has decreased with the usage of DOAC, uh, it was uh, thought to be around or indicated to be around 11% with vitamin K antagonists and now closer to 6 to 7% with direct oral anticoagulants. And so definitely uh, there has been an improvement um, in these uh, adverse event bleeding events across the different um, types of bleeds that we encounter um, for the most part with the use of direct oral anticoagulants as opposed to vitamin K antagonists although GI bleeding remains uh, one of the entities that uh, still is a unique feature to direct oral anticoagulants, uh, spe specifically in the usage of, um, uh, of these uh, molecules, these anti-10A uh, molecules, uh, and the GI bleeding signal is something that we do um, still uh, see uh, in patients taking these medications. So there are six questions that come to mind or that I sort of think about when managing a patient uh, who comes with a, a DOAC-related bleeding in the emergency room. And, and I have to say, I'm not usually the person at the front line uh, dealing with this. 
I'm not an emergentologist. Um, I am a general internal medicine specialist with, uh, as well as a thrombosis medicine specialist. So uh, during this line of the six questions, we do come to help out often our emergency medicine colleagues. Uh, and so we have uh, quite a uh, important role to play. So the first question is how severe is the bleeding? And we'll walk through these in more detail soon. Um, what direct oral anticoagulant has been taken and when? Um, is the direct oral anticoagulant thought to be present in significant amounts? Is there a role for reversal of the direct oral anticoagulant effect? And if so, what is the reversal uh, strategy that one would use? And finally, uh, I think one of the questions that perhaps may not be something considered, um, uh, but is equally important in the management of a direct oral anticoagulant related bleed is when can one resume the direct oral anticoagulant? Again, presumably given that the indication for its use still is uh, remains and, uh, and has been reevaluated, and uh, there is indication that this patient should uh, be resumed on a direct oral anticoagulant at some point in time. So how severe is the bleeding? I don't think I have to um, uh, focus so much on this. Uh, clearly, many of the, mark the markers or the uh, data that we depend on it has to do with our you know, assessment of the patient and uh, determining uh, hemodynamic instability, whether or not this exists in the patient. Um, and, and that obviously uh, is something that is tightly associated with the severity of the bleed. Um, often uh, we divide and the approach that we have is, uh, and something that's, you know, generally uh, an approach that is used um, in most uh, emergency rooms is to determine whether or not the bleeding is, can be classified as a major bleed versus a non-major bleed. And determining this, um, there is some uh, guidance uh, to help us, uh, some um, actually guidance that comes from uh, the need a few years ago, or at least more than 10 years ago, different societies uh, having to come to the realization that a lot of data is coming regarding bleeding from the different trials that looked at anticoagulants and folks using different major bleeding definitions made it very hard to be able to compare drugs on these outcomes or adverse event outcomes. And so um, there are clearly well-defined type of um, bleeding definitions that we use to define major bleeding. And um, often we look at the issue of hemodynamic instability. Uh, we look at the bleeding in critical organ. Uh, and so those tend to be things like the retroperitoneal space, uh, the GI tract, uh, the uh, uh, CNS bleeds, for example. And finally, um, we look for clinically overt bleeding, uh, where it's defined by um, laboratory values, looking at the actual uh, hemoglobin drop with a guidance being around two grams per liter. But obviously, somebody who is near that, it, it would still probably be considered um, uh, to have a major bleed. And how severe is the bleeding um, and what types of bleedings there are? Um, so if we look at uh, the, you know, our initial stratification of thinking about non-major bleeding versus major bleeding, if we look at the non-major bleeding group, some examples here could be, you know, uh, and the reason we do this is it, it, it will speak to how we manage that DOAC as well as the bleed um, in the next uh, phase of our questioning. But uh, some examples of non-major bleeding include things like bruising, um, dental bleeding, uh, you know, anterior epistaxis, hemorrhoidal bleeding, sub subconjunctival hemorrhage, some lacerations would be such examples uh, of uh, bleeding, of non-major bleeding. Um, when we're looking at major bleeding, uh, it's often helpful to differentiate these into not life, limb, or organ threatening uh, versus uh, bleeds or major bleeds that we would uh, consider to be life or limb or organ threatening. Um, and, and there could be, you know, nuances or interpretation to these, uh, but I think some examples that potentially could be thought of as 
not, uh, you know, not life or limb or organ threatening would be hemodynamically GI and GU bleeding, or even posterior epistaxis. Uh, certainly things that really, um, you know, uh, are considered to be a more serious and life-threatening or limb-threatening or organ-threatening would be intracranial hemorrhaging, uh, hemorrhaging in the retroperineal space, the spine, of compartment syndrome, for example, hemodynamic compromise, and um, as well as, you know, uh, a decrease in hemoglobin that is of significant nature, such as over two grams per liter, or they need to transfuse somebody for uh, more than two units of packed red blood cells. And obviously, at the bottom here, you know, a patient may start in one of these areas and move into a more of a life thre threatening or limb threatening uh, type of uh, situation. And that's why clinical reassessment of patients who come in with bleeding is very important um, throughout the, the patient course uh, in the emergency room. And so why we um, think about uh, we how we divide or at least how we approach these bleeds is that it can be very helpful in uh, determining what we do with that direct oral anticoagulant um, in addition to other decisions that one has to make. But, um, you know, more often than not, we feel comfortable in patients who are presenting with non-major bleeding uh, to continue the direct oral anticoagulant during this period of time while local measures are being undertaken uh, to monitor and or to deal with uh, the bleeding. Uh, but it is also an opportunity to think about um, with use of not just, you know, uh, you know, sometimes I, that's where my role comes in. Emergentologists will call me and say, you know, I've discovered that this patient came in with this, you know, non-major bleed, and but he's been on this DOAC forever, and this patient doesn't know why he's been on a DOAC forever, and he's not known for atrial fibrillation, and maybe he had a DVT after knee surgery, you know, 10 years ago. And so often patients may be um, a, a good opportunity to reassess whether or not we need to be on that direct oral antiquite. So the indication may need to be reassessed, perhaps the dose may need to be reassessed, vis-a-vis uh, -vis criterion in cases where the patient has atrial fibrillation and may meet uh, the lower dosing scheme according to product monograph recommendations. Uh, maybe the patient has developed, you know, a chronic kidney disease over time and now finds himself in an area of uh, stage of renal disease where that uh, direct oral anticoagulant uh, is definitely probably causing more harm um, and maybe needs to be reevaluated, or maybe they recently, you know, were started on non-steroidal agents or aspirin or another antiplatelet agent, and perhaps that's also the time to reconsider whether or not whether that antiplatelet needed to be started, or uh, we needed to discontinue that direct oral anticoagulant as a result. So these are important things that are getting considered um, along the timeline of somebody who's presenting with a non-major bleed. In dealing with patients with major bleeds and in either of those categories there, obviously interruption of a DOAC is going to be recommended. Um, and um, depending on the type of bleeding uh, that, are, uh, uh, that we are witnessing, um, there are general measures um, that are very familiar to many of you regarding uh, volume replacement, transfusion support, compression, if it's an external type of uh, bleed. Um, and obviously, sometimes there are definitive measures that can be taken, including the use of reversal and hemostatic measures that certainly almost get used when we're dealing with life, limb, or organ-threatening major bleeding, including um, reversal and hemostatic type of uh, agents that we see here um, for some of the uh, uh, um, uh, direct oral anticoagulants, including dabigatran, uh, where we do have a reversal agent with idarucizumab, uh, factor 10A inhibitors. Uh, we do know there's increasing uh, and recent data on their um, utility, uh, especially with intracranial hemorrhaging and the adnexanet uh, alpha uh, data that's come out. But we also have um, PCC, 
uh, uh, options that we can use for dealing with these bleeding. And finally, adjunct therapy such as antifibrinolytics can be considered. Um, the next question that I often have to uh, uh, address is with our my emergentologist is which DOAC we're using, uh, the patient is using, and do we think it's in significant quantities? Um, especially thinking about the significant quantities have to really be an important consideration because we are dealing with potentially uh, making a decision in the more severe bleeds whether or not we're going to use reversal agents and will there be an opportunity for that reversal agent to have an impact depending on when that DOAC was last taken. And so I just put this up there to just highlight and not it, to show you that um, the, all the DOACs are not made equally. Um, there are dependence on renal clearance for all of them. But for example, dabigatran and edoxaban have a much higher dependence on renal clearance. So certainly in somebody with advanced renal failure and who may happen to be on these medications, um, their, their uh, half-life will be much increased. And so we see these half-lives uh, below according to creatinine clearance. Uh, and clearly, um, those do play a role when we're thinking about whether or not there's significant direct oral anticoagulant present in our patient um, it, it, when making a decision as to whether or not we should be using a reversal agent, uh, because we do want to have significant drug around for that reversal agent to have impact. And when the patient took the last, uh, um, the last dose is going to be important as well. Uh, you know, a patient that's taken the drug 12 to 14 hours ago is uh, in a different situation regarding their major bleeding versus a patient who just took it three to four hours where peak action um, is, is thought to be occurring around that time. And then sometimes I get asked about, you know, coagulation tests and how that can perhaps help me um, in determining if whether or not there are DOAC uh, quantities of sufficient uh, around. Um, and, and obviously, coagulation tests are very difficult, um, or the common coagulation tests that we have are very difficult in measuring the effect of DOAC. We do know river oxygen pro prolongs the PT in a linear effect, but a pixaban and a doxaban are considered to be silent anticoagulants, so they may or not have any effect on the standard coagulation assays. Uh, we know that dabigatran prolongs the PTT and the thrombin time, and in fact, the thrombin time is very sensitive uh, for dabigatran activity, where normal thrombin time essentially rules out any dabigatran effect, but probably uh, it's not something that is readily uh, done in, in many um, hospitals. Um, all DOACs do have specific measures of drug activity, and we do have standardized anti-10A activity kits for rivaroxaban, apixaban, and adoxaban. But again, these may not be um, available in your institutions, and or if they are available in your st institutions, one has to remember that they have to be standardized and, uh, according, and accordingly may not um, be uh, transferable or uh, to other institutional benchmarks. And, um, and so I think these are important um, considerations that overall using your coagulation markers uh, or clotting markers may, or lab markers, sorry, would not be um, necessarily very, uh, allow you to have much guidance in how you manage your patients. Um, but nonetheless, uh, they do uh, perhaps give some an idea that they're qualitatively, there may be uh, some drug around, uh, but uh, but they're not sensitive enough to really uh, bona fidely tell you that you've ruled out any effect whatsoever. And obviously, uh, one has to interpret these coag coagulation testing uh, results based on what we just discussed, uh, you know, the pharmacokinetics of the drug, the dosing interval, the patient's renal function, and so on. So uh, it, it, indication for reversal um, is something that we get asked all the time to help uh, our emergency docs uh, deal with uh, the severe major bleeds that are not controlled with supportive measures. And uh, the question really becomes is if we do use a reversal agent, how, it, uh, how confident are we that there's going to be an expected clinically relevant um, residual plasma DOAC levels there 
that our agents will have an impact on. And, and that's where often we talk about the timing of the last dose. Um, and we often, if we have availability of specific DOAC assays, we do use them. But generally knowing that peak action is usually within three hours of taking a, a drug and knowing that but in a normal renal clearance, a patient with normal renal clearance, generally 14 hours later after taking a drug, there should be you know, minimal effect of that DOAC still remaining, barring some um, you know, nuances between patients. And if we go back to Mary, the last dose of her dabigatrin was six hours ago. We note that her PTT was elevated as we sus would have suspected at 36 seconds. The action that was taken was that dabigatrin was held, the GI console was put in, intravenous fluids were started. Uh, four hours later, though, there seems to be a drop in her blood pressure to 106 over 62 from 134 over 70. She remains tachycardic. And now we get back that her hemoglobin repeat is down to 90 from 110 from a baseline of 125, and she continues to have melina. So we have a polling question here. And uh, the question is, what would not be an appropriate next step? Uh, a, transfusion with uh, packed red blood cells, a use, usage of adenexet alpha, usage of idereucisumab, or usage of um, prothrombin complex concentrate or activated PCC. So please go ahead and uh, vote which would not be an appropriate next step. I okay, so I think uh, uh, clearly that people uh, feel that uh, the next net alpha would not be an appropriate next step, and I would agree with with um, the majority in that this is not um, um, an anti -re a reversal agent uh, for um, uh, dabigatran. and 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 so clearly, if there was going to be a reversal agent. Um, usage for the next appropriate step, this would not be it. I'll move on to the next. So um, just to go through what are the types of agents, if we did, do decide that we do require a next a reversal agent, we have both non-targeted and targeted uh, reversal agents. Um, the non-targeted -tar are um, the, pro the, the uh, prothrombin complex concentrates that um, are available um, uh, for usage in dealing with uh, bleeding uh, uh, that can be used in most emergency rooms. And then we have the targeted, which include the monoclonal antibody that is specific for dabigatran and is available uh, in Canada, uh, which is adereucisumab. And, um, and we do have adexanidine, Adexanid alpha, which is our uh, recombinant human factor 10A variant, it binds to the all the factor 10A inhibitors, and and uh, is something that uh, is showing promise uh, for usage in um, dealing with uh, a, a factor anti direct oral anticoagulants, specifically our anti 10A uh, anticoagulants. Um, especially with uh, bleeding related to intracranial hemorrhage uh, that, were, uh, that were recently um, presented at a stroke uh, uh, conference, and we await uh, further details on that. Um, so sort of uh, kind of uh, describing these agents more closely here, um, the indication for idereucisumab is there, 
uh, both for surgical procedures as well as bleeding uh, uh, events. And uh, for the Andenexanet Alpha program, uh, currently uh, being developed for uh, bleeding and not for usage for uh, surgical or procedural events. Um, just to uh, show you the reverse AD study, um, immediate and sustained relief, uh, reversal with um, we already uh, published a few years ago, uh, showing that in patients both with surgical interventions, as well as presentation of major bleeds in the form of GI bleeding and intracranial hemorrhage, uh, there was a median time to cessation in the bleeding uh, of 2.5 hours for patients with extracranial bleeding and similar type of um, timeline for patients with GI bleeds and for patients uh, undergoing immediate uh, need for urgent procedures, um, that time was down to 1.6 hours. The issue to think about here and be aware of is the issue of thrombotic complications uh, that were observed in this study uh, in the month after administration of up to 4.8%. And that still is something that is of concern, uh, probably with also our uh, Adnexatnet alpha uh, data that uh, we'll talk about later. And so Mary did get idarucizumab uh, and as well as a blood transfusion. She had an endoscopic uh, procedure done, which showed a duodenal ulcer. It was bicap her bleeding resolved and her hemoglobin was stable. Uh, when to resume a DOAC is the next decision-making that gets done. Um, sometimes it's not done in the emergency room. It may be done when the patient is admitted upstairs, uh, up uh, to, into the, to the ward. Um, and really it's an intricate patient dependent individual decision-making that takes on uh, an important consideration in the patient trajectory. Um, it really uh, starts off with ensuring that bleeding has stopped um, and then looking at the ongoing indication for that direct oral anticoagulant. And that really re involves a decision that looks at the bleeding risk associated um, with further bleeding for this patient versus the thrombotic risk that could be associated should that anticoagulant be stopped uh, temporarily for a long period of time or permanently. And uh, it's not an easy task. It depends on understanding why that patient's um, indication uh, for the in the first place uh, required that particular anticoagulant. And sometimes that may require decision-making to be done, not even when the patient's in the admitted, but in a clinic setting uh, um, a few weeks later. And obviously uh, there needs to be decision sharing with the patient um, to to uh, to come to a, a decision as to whether or not uh, to resume or not that anticoagulant. So now I'll pass this over to Dr. DeWitt, who will talk to us about intracranial bleeding. Thanks so much, Dr. Taglakis. If I could ask you to advance the slide to me, thanks. So I have no disclosures to make. So this case is an 85-year-old man who presents to the emergency after a fall at home. Next slide. So he has a history of atrial fibrillation. He also has a history of hypertension and diabetes. And his current medications are amlodipine, apixaban, and citagliptin metformin. Next slide. So our first polling question is, does apixaban put this patient at risk of intracranial bleeding? A, yes, apixaban, apixaban does increase the risk of intracranial bleeding, or B, no, apixaban use in this patient does not increase the risk of intracranial bleeding. I'll give uh, just a few more seconds. <clears throat> 
so as those responses are coming in, it seems overwhelmingly that the thought is that a pixaban would increase his risk. We have one person who thinks otherwise, two people. Um, if we could advance the slides. So this is really the only study that partially answers this question. So this is a study by, led by Kirat Gruwal using ICES data. Um, and uh, she looked at the population level of presentations to Ontario emergency departments of people over the age of 65 presenting with a head injury. And of course, the vast majority of head injuries in people over the age of 65 uh, relate to falls on level ground. So the study ended up matching patients who took warfarin with patients who took direct oral anticoagulants and warfarin with no oral anticoagulants and direct oral anticoagulants with no oral anticoagulants. And what I've highlighted here in the red square is that the patients who took a direct oral anticoagulant had the same risk of being diagnosed with an intracranial bleed as, though, as those who were taking no oral anticoagulants. So although this study doesn't answer the question about apixaban in particular, it does suggest that being on a direct oral anticoagulant and sustaining a head injury in somebody who's over the age of 65 does not increase your risk of intracranial bleeding. That is in contrast to patients who were taking warfarin where there was a marginal increased risk in the incidence of intracranial bleeding. Next slide. So if we go back to our case, this 85 year old man, um, if you could just advance uh, for one second, thank you. Um, this 85 year old man has hit his head when he fell and he's got a bruise on the right parietal aspect of his scalp. He was a witness to lose consciousness when he fell and he's presenting now with a headache. So you've ordered a head CT scan and this is the head CT. The patient has an isolated um, subarachnoid bleed, so a traumatic subarachnoid bleed. There is no additional bleeding um, intracranial. Uh, next slide, please. So our next polling question is, what should you do with his anticoagulant? Should you choose to continue the apixaban? Are you going to hold the apixaban? Will you give prothrombin com complex concentrates such as octoplex? or um, will you give Andexanet Alpha? Next slide. This question isn't quite as easy. So, so far, most people would hold as a pixaban. Nobody's voting to continue. And then there are a few votes for prothrombin complex concentrate or andexanet alpha. So let's take a look at what we know about isolated traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. But unfortunately, we don't know a lot. There has been one meta-analysis which combined both prospective and retrospective cohort studies, but they were specifically looking at the risk of death and poor outcome following this isolated subarachnoid bleed. So they found that neurosurgical intervention was incredibly rare for these patients. So 0.002% of everybody in their data set, which was over 15,000 patients, ended up having neurosurgery. They found that of those studies that monitored for progression of the bleed, 6% of patients had bleed progression. But um, of the studies that rather than looked for at progression, but instead looked at neurological clinical deterioration, only one in a hundred patients developed neurological deterioration. And overall, 0.6% of everybody with a traumatic subarachnoid bleed died. So overall, I think we can say that these are low risk bleeds. Next slide. And then if we go back to the same study, um, looking at the administrative health data, 
this is really the only data that partially answers what's the additional risk of being on a direct oral anticoagulant because those, that previous meta-analysis included patients with and without anticoagulation. So if we compare the uh, mortality rate at 30 days following a traumatic intracranial bleed, so this would include all types of traumatic intracranial bleeding between direct oral anticoagulants and people who are not taking any oral anticoagulants, the mortality rate was the same. It was about 16%. So the mortality is high after traumatic intracranial bleeding, but it doesn't seem to be any worse for patients who are taking direct oral anticoagulants. Of course, there, there will be some confounding here because we don't know what happened to the direct oral anticoagulant. We don't know if anybody continued. I imagine most people discontinued, and we don't have any data here in the study on whether they underwent reversal. And this is all types of intracranial bleeding. Next slide. So if we were going to consider holding the anticoagulant, then we have to think about what would be the risk to the patient. And in this patient, he takes a pixaban to prevent a stroke. And clearly, an ischemic stroke could be just as devastating an outcome as a progressive intracranial bleed. So a rule of thumb, super easy to remember. If we want to inform the patient of his risk of stroke, um, one way to calculate his yearly risk of stroke is by doubling his CHADS2 score. So he's 85, he's hypertensive, and he's a diabetic, so he has a CHADS2 score of 3. That would mean, roughly speaking, that over a year, if he wasn't taking an anticoagulant or an antiplatelet, then his risk of stroke would be 6% every year. Taking the anticoagulant will reduce that drastically, likely much lower than 1%. So, um, if I was going to hold the anticoagulant, I definitely would have that discussion with the patient. And the other thing to add in that scenario is when we hold the anticoagulant, the risk of stroke is slightly front loaded. So there's a higher risk of stroke in the first week or two weeks after holding the anticoagulation compared to the rest of the year. Next slide. So current guidelines would say, yes, we should hold the anticoagulant because there's likely a low risk that this uh, traumatic subarachnoid bleed is going to cause death or um, worsening neurological um, deterioration, then I wouldn't recommend giving any type of reversal agent. Next slide. And uh, next slide. So, what sort of type, what kind of reversal could we give? And we've already mentioned andectinet alpha, which was recently reviewed by Health Canada and has not yet been reviewed provincially by any of the Canadian provinces. So we expect that we will have access in the future to andectinet alpha, but we don't know how much it will cost and exactly in what situation we'll be allowed to use it. However, we do have some limited data that Dr. Tagalagas has already referred to. Um, so there was, um, th there's a randomized controlled trial with about 440 patients, which has not yet, yet been published, but has been presented recently at a conference. And this data comes from that conference. And I think it's relevant for us to look at it. So this was a trial which randomized patients with intracranial bleeding to either receive andexanet alpha or standard care. And it's important to recognize that the standard care, the vast majority of people had prothrombin concentrate. Um, so 87% of them had prothrombin concentrate. The inclusion criteria for the study was any sort of intracranial bleeding between the size of 0.5 mils and 60 mils. And I believe that they started off with all types of intracranial bleed, but shortly into recruitment, they started to focus on intracerebral bleeding. So that data is yet to be available. Um, the patient had to have had symptoms for less than six hours, and they had to have taken either a pixaban, rivaroxaban, or a doxaban within the last 15 hours, and they had to present with a GCS higher than seven. Next slide. Their primary outcome was at 12 hours. So this is not a study looking at functional outcome six months later. This is the primary outcome was just 12 hours later, and it was a composite outcome. So they looked to see how many people ended up have, having hematoma expansion less than 35% and who had less than a seven point rise in their NIH stroke scale 
and who did not require any rescue therapy for their anticoagulant reversal. They found that those who received andexanet alpha, 64% of these patients achieved that better outcome versus 54% of patients who received standard of care. And you might remember that was mostly prothrombin complex concentrate. Next slide. Now, this is very relevant and important data. So they also published the complication rate in both arms. And this is the first time we've had access to trial data. So this is a randomized trial. So all things should be equal between both arms, except for the andexanet alpha or the usual care. The main finding was that the rate of thrombotic complications was doubled in the patients who were given andexanet alpha compared to usual care. And in particular, the rate of ischemic stroke was 5% higher, an absolute increase of 5%. So amongst those who were given andexanet alpha, they had 5% higher risk of developing an ischemic stroke compared to those who were given the prothrombin complex concentrate. So for me, I interpret this to mean that andexanet alpha might be a benefit to these patients, but I feel that they have to be at a significant risk for neurological deterioration because I think the 5% risk of stroke is, is, is not small, it's quite sizable. So I think going back to our patient, it would be best for us not to offer indexnet alpha at, at, in this um, current stage from what we know with the data. Next slide. So typically you speak to neurosurgery and they say, oh, he's fine. You can just hold the apixaban and send the patient home. Next slide. So you go and reassess the patient, and um, it turns out that he can do everything independently at home, but he does live with his wife and his daughter, so he's got good supports. He's already been up walking to the washroom with his walker, and he's just had his dinner, and he's asking you, can he go home? Next slide. So what are the things that would be important to arrange uh, if you're comfortable to let him go home? Then we obviously need to counsel him to come back if he develops any signs of stroke, because that might either be an ischemic stroke or a worsening of his bleed, or if his headache becomes worse. You want to organize for somebody to reassess his anticoagulant, and that might be a neurosurgical outpatient clinic, it could be an internal medicine clinic or his family physician. And it's always important to communicate with his family physician so they're aware of what's happening. Next slide. So that brings me to the end of a case of traumatic subarachnoid bleeding. And I'm going to hand back to Dr. Tagalakis. Hi, thank you very much. Um, so now we're going to uh, shift gears a little bit and talk about initiation of DOACs in patients at high risk of bleeding. So alluding to the end of our case with Mary, um, having to do um, how do we uh, determine this? Um, so here we have John, uh, who is a 69-year-old man, colorectal cancer, stage three post-right-sided um, uh, hemicolectomy and undergoing Folfox adjuvant-based therapy. He presents to the emergency room with shortness of breath for three days. His past medical history includes dyslipidemia, hypertension, medications are noted there. His vital signs show some tachycardia at 100 beats per minute. Um, his blood pressure is, is fairly good and his laboratory values are noted there. What you note know specifically is he has some anemia, his platelets are at 150, uh, but uh, clearly he has uh, renal failure uh, with a creatinine of 100, uh, 210 uh, micromoles per liter from a baseline of 24 uh, micromoles per liter per minute that uh, for a crown clearance of 24 micromoles, uh, mils per minute, apologies for that. Um, so John uh, astutely, uh, the physicians uh, assessing him, um, recommend that this patient has a high um, well score for, um, uh, sorry, has a high uh, suspicion for PE and undergoes a CTP scan. And he's noted to have bilateral PE uh, in this patient with cancer who now you discover has some renal uh, dysfunction. So he's in your emergency room. Um, it is a case of a PE. You're about to start an anticoagulant and you're wondering what should be done given that this patient uh, has some renal dysfunction and we just 
heard earlier that uh, all the DOACs do have some dependence on renal function for their um, uh, pharmacokinetics. So first polling question for this case is, which of the following is an option for acute VTE? A, a Pixaban 10 milligrams twice a day for seven days, then five milligrams twice a day. Low molecular weight heparin for five days, then a doxaban 60 milligrams once a day. A Pixaban 10 milligrams twice a day for seven days, then 2.5 milligrams for twice a day. And low molecular weight heparin five days, uh, concomitantly with a vitamin K antagonist, then vitamin K antagonist alone when the INR is greater than two. So here's our polling question, and um, we'll wait for the answers to come in. So, so great. We see that, um, you know, most people would consider a Pixaban 10 milligrams twice a day, then five milligrams twice a day. But there are a significant proportion of the audience who would consider uh, starting with the seven days of 10 milligrams, but then quickly coming down to the 2.5 milligrams twice a day. And, and this is something that I want to um, focus on is um, the fact that um, we have direct oral anticoagulants that are used for different indications, but in fact, these indications carry different dosing. And because we've recognized this patient has renal dysfunction, um, we do associate renal dysfunction with an associated higher risk of bleeding. We know that there's a 2.5 milligram dose available, but in fact, uh, the 2.5 milligram dose is not available for the treatment of acute venous thromboembolism. It is available after six months of therapy uh, for acute venous thromboembolism, but not in the acute uh, uh, stages. Uh, and in fact, this 2.5 milligram in an acute uh, setting is not part of the indication for the treatment of VT. And so the correct answer would be a well, one of the more appropriate answers would be a Pixaban 10 milligrams twice a day, then five milligrams uh, twice a day. Um, the reason that edoxaban and vitamin K, tag, I mean, edoxaban would not be considered is the fact that the renal dysfunction is quite severe and that would preclude using the 60 milligram dosing. And obviously one could use low molecular weight heparin and warfarin, although that is considered substandard care for a cancer-associated thrombosis using vitamin K antagonists. So this is um, for the acute treatment of VT in general, DOACs are preferred over vitamin K antagonists uh, for the reasons noted there. Um, DOACs are preferred over low molecular weight heparin for cancer-associated thrombosis, uh, except in certain circumstances, significant drug-drug interactions, high risk of upper GI bleed, as we have seen a signal for the DOACs in patients with upper GI uh, luminal cancers. And obviously, high risk of bleeding is something that we have to think about in these situations, such as end-stage renal disease and severe thrombocytopenia in cancer patients. This is what I was alluding to, and I'd like to highlight it again, is that in the management of acute VTE, uh, these are the dosing, uh, product monograph dosing uh, for the different direct oral anticoagulants uh, in, in managing acute VTE. And we note for apixaban, there is no role for the 2.5 milligram. Um, and so that is one of the things I wanted to highlight uh, with this question, because it can be very confusing uh, dealing with uh, two different uh, entities, atrial fibrillation and VTE, who have different dosing potentially. And then we know in the acute VTE, in the first few days, 
the dosing is different for every one of these agents. And here I wanna highlight some of the aspects that uh, could be helpful when determining which DOAC to use when you're faced with a patient with an acute PE in the emergency room and has some renal dysfunction. Uh, essentially for patients above CRAN clearances of 30 mils per minute, um, generally speaking, um, we can go ahead and use uh, any of the uh, direct oral anticoagulants and follow the recommended product monograph dosing for them. Again, I highlight the 2.5 does not have a role uh, for the apixaban uh, specifically. One little highlight here is the adoxaban. It's the only direct oral anticoagulant that does have a dose reduction uh, that was studied in their Hokusai uh, VT study uh, that does provide you the affordability of using 30 milligrams instead of the 60 milligram in patients with creatinine clearance of 30 to 50 mils per minute. What happens in our case where the creatinine clearances are less than 30 mils per minute? And that's where we see there are variabilities across the different direct oral anticoagulants. Clearly, uh, there is no um, uh, good data to suggest that we can use dabigatran or adoxaban safely in these low-level um, renal function categories. And but there is increasing uh, post-launch um, of uh, the, the landmark RCT that used apixaban versus uh, traditional anticoagulants to show that they were just as effective and safe uh, for the treatment of acute VT. Since then, we've had a lot of observational studies as well as cohort studies that seem to show that um, apixaban uh, still affords uh, uh, very uh, affords a very beneficial uh, impact on treating efficacy of VT while minimizing risks of bleeding down to creatinine clearances of 15 mils per minute. Now, I've cross-checked it here in green to show that uh, this is not um, RCT-type data, but certainly um, there, there is increasing uh, affordability of using uh, this uh, medication for these low creatinine clearances. And uh, certainly there is some consideration of using it rivaroxaban at these low levels, uh, but certainly the data is not as clear as it is for apixaban. And so what if John, though, presented with new non-valvular atrial fibrillation instead of VTE? Uh, and I just alluded to, there are more DOAC dosing options for these patients. Uh, there's no initial higher dose in the first seven to 21 days that I showed you in that box for that various DOACs. And in fact, we have increasing data regarding DOAC efficacy and safety in CKD in atrial fib uh, patient populations. Um, this is a recent meta-analysis that was done that looked at the various um, DOAC studies that looked at specifically AFib and chronic kidney disease. Uh, and we see that in these meta-analyses that looked at stroke or thromboembolism, major bleeding and all-cause death across the various creatinine clearances within every one of these outcomes down to creatinine clearances of less than 30 mils per minute. If we meta-analyzed all these, it, it, it looks like um, DOACs are, have a safer profile uh, uh, individually in the various um, uh, uh, outcomes, whether it be stroke or thromboembolism, major bleeding, uh, there certainly seems to be a predilection for favoring, favoring direct oral anticoagulants over warfarin. And moreover, when we look at specifically the different direct oral anticoagulants versus warfarin, it seems like apixaban is probably the preferred DOAC for advanced CKD, whether we're looking at major bleeding or stroke. And uh, here is where we have a lot more different dosing uh, uh, a potential uh, for atrial fibrillation uh, according to renal function. I won't go through all of these, but certainly this is something where there is variability in the dose uh, that can be done when dealing with atrial fibrillation. The message though is that for acute VTE, uh, we're much more restricted. And again, I just wanna highlight with this last slide, 
is that the data is constantly evolving in patients with atrial fibrillation and chronic kidney disease, especially in the lower creatinine clearance. And in fact, um, there is increasing and there are ongoing trials looking to see A, whether anticoagulants period uh, should be used uh, or are beneficial uh, in patients with creatinine clearances uh, less than 15 mils per minute uh, to guide us, uh, given the fact that there are uh, lots of concerns of increased bleeding, um, irrespective of the type of anticoagulant that is used in patients with severe CKD and end-stage renal disease. And I point this out because there is going to be more data coming in this realm, and um, which is actually questioning whether or not uh, we should be uh, considering anticoagulant use in these patients. And, and moreover, uh, just to highlight the fact that um, certainly we're probably going to be moving away from vitamin K antagonist usage in these uh, low creatinine clearance uh, areas uh, and, and preferentiating DOACs uh, based on the fact that increasingly we're recognizing that there are concerns with vitamin K antagonist usage uh, especially in patients with known vascular calcification, calciphylaxis, uh, and so on. So back to John, uh, we discussed with John the risk and benefits of anticoagulation, that he is a candidate for a Pixaban 5 milligrams twice a day after initial 10 milligrams twice a day for seven days, this, this bolus effect that we give initially. Uh, but we do need to monitor his CRAN clearance we don't set, you know, I like this quote, don't set it and forget it. Cran clearances can change. And so uh, we're confident at around 28 mils per minute that we can use this type of dosing, uh, but we need to keep uh, look following these patients for the period of time that they're on the anticoagulant and keep doing the math to ensure that we don't um, uh, cause more bleeding because the patient has advancing renal dysfunction. And then if the cran clearance falls below 15 mils per minute, then we will need to reassess the options that we have for him um, because obviously acute management of VT, the 2.5 milligram is not uh, available to us. So that takes it to the end. Thank you very much. Um, I guess I'll stop sharing. Very good. So thank you very much to Dr. Tagalakis and Dr. DeWitt for a, a great presentation on a very complicated uh, subject area. Um, we're, a little, we're, we're running a little bit over time. A couple of quick questions, though, that came up. One is just about, um, I, I think, largely based on the fact these are expensive medications um, and having to justify uh, using them. Um, are there any, is, is there any kind of point of care testing that's on the horizon for, for these agents? Uh, for, for the reversal agents? Mm -hmm. No, sorry, for for for, um, for the level of anti ten A inhibition, or for the or for the drugs themselves, right? Present. Yeah, so um, I know there's some point of care testing in development, uh, not anything that's ready to be commercialized or ready to be in use. Uh, certainly, um, we do have specific uh, monitoring assays. Uh, that some labs use in some hospital centers for monitoring whether or not there is DOAC uh, quantity still uh, in, in patients when they're presenting with bleeding. Uh, but I know there was one that was close to commercialization and um, it, it never received regulatory uh, authorization for whatever reason. Um, but I'm not aware of any other point of care testing. Right. And, and would you say based on history and an INR or a, an elevated PTT and some other big trend that that would be sufficient to, to guide your decision? Uh, so certainly, like I pointed out, uh, it's uh, certainly not a quantitative uh, measure. Uh, it can certainly guide me in thinking that qualitatively, there's probably some drug still there. Um, I usually use, as I pointed out, and probably was pointed out in the trial, a, a 12, you know, if, if the patient has taken their last, you know, if there is elevated markers, like a PTT or, um, uh, and the patient took their drug in the past 12 to 15 hours, 
I would think that that probably constitutes an effect of the drug and there could be a benefit for using a reversal agent if the measures being used to, to, to up to that point in time have not been effective. Uh, but certainly, you know, um, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, you may not know when the last uh, dose was taken and, and then you have to kind of go by the seat of your pants and say, you know, the, the, we have no other reason why this PTT should be elevated. So we'll, we'll probably think that there is some drug effect still present. Right. Okay. Maybe one more question uh, for Dr. Duet. Um, just in light of the um, uh, data you presented about Ontario bleeds and on fixaban versus no uh, oral anticoagulants, what's, what's your practice in terms of imaging patients with on DOAX with, with minor or, or trivial head injuries? Well, I feel like that question has been planted. <laughs> um, um, conducting a big study at the moment on head injuries in uh, anticoagulated patients. And we've just finished a study which will be published next month, hopefully, deriving a decision rule for um, older adults who've fallen uh, to determine the need for brain imaging. And uh, a very interesting point was that anticoagulation played no role in that decision. And in fact, um, one of the strongest associations with having intracranial bleeding was simply just having hit their head. So if the patient has signs of head injury or they tell you they hit their head, uh, they had a witness head injury, and even the group of patients who said uh, they had no idea if they hit their head or you know they have dementia, they can't give a history, all of those patients have a higher risk of intracranial bleeding and merit a CT scan, regardless of whether they're on an anticoagulant or not. Um, that's really the best available evidence. All right, thank you. I think we've, we're probably a little bit over time, so we probably should uh, um, end there. Uh, thanks again for a, a really interesting and very informative talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.